faculty, staff, and students, we want to welcome you to the Emerson Performance Center on this historic campus for what will be an enlightening, provocative, and engaging discussion. Ferguson, the world, one year later, is a symposium designed to delve into the meaning and implication of that fateful day on August 9th, 2014, the shooting death of Michael Brown, which has changed our community and in a sense, the world forever. Issues of social justice and the use of protest as a method for social change has found a new generation that has now spanned globally. Harris Stowe has been a constant in this movement and is proud to be the intellectual think tank on issues that confront our community, as well as providing educational opportunities for the next wave of leaders. This is our priority. In fact, more than 40% of students that are enrolled and graduate from Harris Stowe are from the North County area. Harris Stowe has adopted the elementary schools in the Ferguson Florissen School District, and we've been working all the entire year with these schools. Our students serve as mentors to these students, and we have sponsored college days, and we have brought these students on our campus. One area that we are extremely proud of is the recent Emerson Scholarship Program for students majoring in STEM fields related, and we provide full financial support and these are only for students in the North County area. Partnerships not only with the Ferguson, Florissant, Riverview Gardens, and Jenny School District provide meaningful solutions for our educational systems. Let's begin our symposium by welcoming our moderator, Dr. Ronaldo Anderson, Associate Professor of Communication at Harris Stowe State University. You can read his bio along with the other panelists on this afternoon's program. Again, welcome to Harris Stowe State University, and let's welcome Dr. Anderson. Good evening. Uh, last year, our symposium that we had was loosely structured based upon the Kerner Commission report that we had within the days. I know personally, when I reflect back on those events of last year, I remember how fast things unfolded, people's responses to it, some people that are on the panel I met in, uh, I remember I think I first met Larry, I think was that over a dinner? We were sitting next to Damon Davis and I remember then uh, I think Janetta had a fro when I first met her. Uh, Jasmine Eagle was running all over the place and uh, I remember it was just a very stressful time for everybody and as I mentioned to him back in the green room, I said I think it's a year to take stock what has happened, what needs to happen, what has not been done, have things changed? And I think it's very important for the historical record that we capture these historical moments for uh, future generations to explain why people were thought the way they did, did what they did in terms of uh, from this point moving forward. I wish my president was here so I could recognize him because I want to publicly acknowledge that he was one of the first people. He hadn't been here six weeks when he took charge of this university. I thought he really rolled with the situation as it unfolded in terms of getting the university involved in the community activities surrounding the events of Ferguson. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce um, the first panel. I have Representative Michael Butler, a Democrat represents St. Louis District 79. Uh, Mr. Mike Jones served as a senior policy advisor to St. Louis County Executive Charlie Dooley. I have Dr. Sadarsan Kant, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Harris Stowe State University, and Senator Jamila Nasheed, a Democrat, represents the fifth senatorial district in the Missouri State Senate. Um, and one of the things I don't want to lose sight of the fact is everything that has happened since last year, and sometimes I think people lose sight of the fact there are a whole lot of people or institutions that are basically benefiting, in my personal opinion, on the blood of that young man that was spilt last year. And a lot of times they leave that focus out of the paperwork that they do. And a lot of people, whether it's uh, Vondrette Myers, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, the Emmanuel Nine, and Sandra Bland, and many others, we're, we need to reassess this also in that context. When we're talking about the world, one of the things I remember uh, that I really liked during the event uh, I remember when the, the night I went down there on West Florissant, 
Whereas I remember when the Palestinian kids were emailing, I mean, I'm sorry, Instagramming and tweeting kids over here. I remember the Mexican kids down there rioting in Mexico. I saw people marching in Hong Kong, Germany, and so forth. So this did have a ripple quick effect across the world. My first question for Senator Mash Jamila Mashid, because I remember when I saw you down there, or you were always down there talking. If you weren't marching, you were talking with local media. And in light of what happened last year with problems, whether it's here specifically locally here in the state of Missouri, has anything changed? You know, that's a very, very good question. But before I answer that question, let me uh, first and foremost thank Harris Stowe for um, hosting this symposium today is much needed, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank each and every one of you for coming out. And we have to give these young folks that really ignited this movement a round of applause. Let's give other young folks a round of applause. I can truly say that a lot has changed since the tragic death of, of Michael Brown. Uh, when you look back on this day uh, a year ago, and the 10th, we saw the burning of the Quick Trip. This year, we will see a development by way of Urban League that will provide so many needed services to the indigent people that are in Ferguson and throughout the, and throughout the county, North County, uh, from job creation to GED programs to utility assistance. So that's one thing that has changed. And we also had the opportunity to see those individuals who many of us were protesting against, uh, the elected officials in, in Ferguson, many of them are gone now. We have an African-American chief, we have an African-American, uh, two African-American city councilmen, and we have the, uh, manage, the manager, city manager, manager that's uh, African-American. And we also had the opportunity to pass a piece of legislation Senate Bill 5 that really deals with the underlying issue that so many of those young folk were out there protesting against. The political and the economic oppression, the things that they felt far too long is something that we were able to deal with by way of Senate Bill 5. Those young folks were being locked up simply because they could not pay a fine or a failure to appear. But guess what, that's over. No longer would that happen. So we've seen many things uh, that came out of Ferguson, but we have a lot, a lot, a lot of movement and a lot of growth to come. Because I can tell you this here, we're going to still fight for body cameras. We're going to still fight to change the Tennessee versus Gartner's law, where you, can know, you cannot shoot an unarmed man fleeing. And that's what happened to Michael Brown on August the 9th today. So yeah, we, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. Okay. Um, in the program, it has, if you want to ask a question, please go on Twitter under hashtag Ferguson1, and they will bring me a question. Um, Dr. Kunt, I know as an office mate, we've talked about this as scholars around the idea of the social contract. And we talked about how the social contract here, the fabric of it here, basically was not working. As people understand it, a social contract uh, is supposed to be operating when you have a just society. And could you illuminate more upon that idea in terms of the social contract with what you were talking about in relation to policing and a couple of other points I know that you want to make? Uh, thank you. Um, the social contract, as we understand in uh, in a liberal democracy is basically a, uh, it's a reciprocal agreement that, uh, that citizens and individuals uh, we make uh, with the state. Uh, basically what we are saying is that we will give up certain rights and certain freedoms in exchange for protection from the state. Uh, and that's the bedrock of, of the liberal democratic idea as articulated in, uh, in the West. Uh, the, uh, so let me just go back one, one step and start with a complaint. Is that one of the persistent complaints we have uh, is that minorities particularly are 
don't exercise their franchise or vote in low numbers. It's, uh, the data seems to support that. So here we have a problem where a liberal democracy functions because we individuals empower our political leaders through the vote to make decisions on our behalf. So it's a consensual agreement. We are, you know, the rule of law governed by the, by the consent of the people. But, but here's a problem though. How long do people exercise their rights to vote, yet do not receive the necessary benefits of their votes? How long do people have to vote when they are neglected by the state when it comes to meeting their most basic human needs? So they say there's a bit of hypocrisy that we complain that the people that ought to participate in the political process are not participating, but at the same time, the obligation of the state to provide for the needs of its most vulnerable citizens are never met. And sooner or later, individuals will become disengaged from the political process when you keep on denying them the very uh, means of surviving in society. So the social contract is a social obligation. It's it's a social responsibility. It cuts both ways. Okay, Mike Jones. One of the things I talked about earlier in private, we talked about the Ferguson draft, the draft of the Ferguson Commission. And we talked about the Kerner Report when we had this symposium last year. And uh, uh, I was gonna say, if this was a jazz group, this, uh, the song I rehearsed was the one that you asked your real was like, what about it a year later? But uh, since it is jazz, I think I can fold this one yours in. And I do wanna tie it back to the Kerner Commission because seriously, the way I would answer that question in the context of your first question is everything has changed and nothing has changed. So what do I mean by everything has changed? That the movement or the nascent movement that has grown out of August 9th and, and the murder of Mike Brown and more importantly the response to the non-response of the murder of Mike Brown uh, and I see uh, my, my good friend and, and, and intellectual counterbalance of Eric uh, uh, Vickers sitting in the front row. Eric, for me, that moment felt like June 16, 1966, with Kwame Toure on the back of a flatbed truck, AKA Stokely Carmichael, talking about black power. So if you're my age and Eric's age, America turn the page then just you started to redefine the relationship between the black community particularly the young black community and the rest of america and we went from talking about please include us to demanding our rights as inherent and the right to uh be opposed on the other thing that i think makes ferguson or post ferguson feel like the 60s is the youth of the people leading it because the black power movement was led by young people. When you get people as old as me in a room, what you get is old, tired, and cautious. And you don't make social change with people who are old, tired, and cautious. Uh, 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 you make change with people who are young enough to have the energy and are, and are audacious enough to challenge the assumptions on which any system rests. This is the other thing that Ferguson or, the, or Black Lives Matter uh, is similar to what I would consider uh, the, black, the, the nascent black power movement uh, of my youth. The other thing that is historically consistent with another thing, the number of women, the sisters who have stepped up and provided leadership and that's not an apparition in black history. If, if you think about 
Sojourner Truth, uh, uh, Harriet Tubman, but more important, 20th century people like Ida B. Wells uh, uh, and uh, uh, folks like folks like that, then you have ha always had women on the front line. You've always had sisters on the front line of serious radical social change when it comes to American black folks. So that that's the second historical parallel uh, for me between what has happened out of Ferguson and what happened in, in, in the 60s. I'll take some exception at a, at a strategic, not tactical level with what Jamila said. What I, the reason I don't think anything has changed is every problem that black America faces is systemic and is structural. It's deeply embedded in both the culture and the history of the country. And you don't change that overnight. That takes long-term struggle over uh, an extended period of time. And it takes having a consciousness and a cognition that keeps you in the field every day, independent of what's, of what's going on. So I would argue we haven't seen that level of organization, uh, I'll call it structural organization, to challenge that. So if you want to know kind of what grew out of the black power movement, whole host of things, but at the political level, you ended up with mayors like Coleman Young, Maynard Jackson, uh, Marion Barry, uh, 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 I'll argue a comptroller like Vervis Jones, who structurally changed the relationship between commercial, white commercial political power and the black community, and they made revolutionary change. And they are all products of that change in dynamic that happened, I would argue, in June 1966. So the one thing that, that I think you got to decide if you're black is what is the real relationship between us and America, uh, really us and white supremacy in America. There's one argument that I think is rather naive that is based on ignorance and people don't know that is going on. And if you just appeal to conscience and educate them, things would change. And there's another darker, but I would argue more realistic uh, 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 point of view that says that white supremacy, the structural and systemic nature of it in America is a function of interest and advantage and is conscious. And if you believe that, then you come with a different political strategy than appeals to conscience. You understand that you have to balance power with power, and you have to look for ways to be uh, 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 asymmetrical in your political warfare with the system, because that's really then becomes what, what you are. And, okay. and I'm going to close with this comment, uh, this quote. Cornel West wrote a book a year or so ago called Black Prophetic Fire. And he really kind of sums up, I think, where we are and have to decide. He says, if, if high status in American society and white reference uh, points of reference are the measure of the black freedom movement, then this moment in black history is the ultimate success. But if the suffering of black people, especially po black poor and working people, is the ultimate measure of, black, of the black freedom movement, then this moment in history is catastrophic sadly continuous with the past. So the reality is, I think, the, 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 the organization and the protest that, that's coming out of the August 9th uh, uh, movement, and that's what I call it, and uh, pretend like I'm mild here for a minute, uh, uh, is consistent with our history of long-term struggle, but is also consistent with recognizing the structural nature of the forces that are aligned against us. He's gonna let me get in on it. I'm gonna add to it. Yeah, just to continue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I, me and wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. I've heard two times when we talked about Black Lives Matter, change, and the term Black Power. Black Lives Matter is a value. So, to defend that value, what is then the elected Black representation responsibility to defend that value? And if that value cannot be defended properly, as it is currently, as what's going on, what are some other things to think about? So, um, 
that value as far as for me, as far as what happened on August 9th is um, is that we haven't made changes because Darren Wilson is still free. Darren Wilson is free and he's richer <laughs> than what he was before. Um, when we marched, and I, not, I, me not as much as many of the actors that we're going to hear later, when, th when those young people were out there, when those thousands of people you know, went to school late or, or left school early and, and came out to West Florissant, they were hoping to make systemic change and their number one demand was let's get Darren Wilson indicted. And we did not get that done. Then many, many of his colleagues were, were doing these things all across the country and they're still free. Even worse than that, many, I believe Darren Wilson and many of his colleagues, they're still on the street. They're still police officers. They have the right and now the backing of the federal government, the local government and the state government to continue to do the things that we sought, that we, we resisted them and we believe that they shouldn't be able to do anymore. So on that note, you're right. A lot has changed, we've had some small incremental uh, laws and, and that's the way that, that lawmaking works, but nothing has changed. Darren Wilson is still free and the culture of, of blue versus black, the culture of, um, a, a, of a stop and frisk is still alive and well today in St. Louis and across the country. One so okay. where, where is our responsibility? Our responsibility as African American elected officials is to make sure that we become the decision makers over the Darren Wilsons and the Chief Jacksons of the world. That we become, we, we become the ones that appoint the people that then fill those jobs that then will respect our community. Where is our responsibility before that is to, is to work with the activist community to organize folks in, in, their, in their areas that, that will vote and put, and, and put the right elected officials in, the right African American elected officials, not just in African American, the right African American elected officials to make those choices. So, What's, what's more, what, now what, where that all comes into play is that there is a lot of oppression going on in St. Louis, but there's also a lot of Mia Cooper in the black community. A lot Six, of what? Mia, what I call Mia Cooper. The okay. old, the, the old uh, uh, term were my fault, where, we, where there were many Africans in, 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 in the Af in, that sold their, 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 uh, the natives of Africa into slavery and, into the slave trade and the, and the trans-American slave trade. Mia Cooper. We are having that here in St. Louis when we have 67% of the, of the community in Ferguson is African American and yet we can't elect the people that, that will choose the police chief choose the, choose, and, and, and the hire Darren Wilsons. We, we, we have to acknowledge the oppression. We also have to acknowledge that the Mia Cooper in the city of St. Louis where 48% of the, of the population is, is, is African American yet we have the same issues. The city of St. Louis is a Ferguson. Okay. And we're gonna and, and we can get to you on that more, but All right, uh, we got a lot going on. We okay. and we have a lot of responsibility. All right, one minute response from Senator and she and yeah. then and Dr. listening to Trump. the dialogue with my brothers here. One minute. You Please. know, I, I think that you know critical thinking people know that you can look at a glass half empty and half full. And when I say uh, that things has changed okay. when it comes to the Senate Bill Five, well, you tell a young brother who wake up every morning, fear. Fear and the fear that they would get locked up and go from one municipality to the next municipality to the next municipality with a total of a thousand dollars and can't get out. When you tell them nothing has changed, they gonna think they gonna say no. It's changed for me. Okay. So so but but what hasn't changed though? The systemic problems like education reform. Okay. We have children that are graduating from the kindergarten to the twelfth grade not knowing how to read on the third grade level. If we want to see change in America, we have to start with the educational structure as we see it today. If we want to see change in America and in the St. Louis area, we have to begin to say that even if you was locked up and you paid your debt to society, we're not going to hold that over your head. Because too many of our young brothers and sisters are coming home knocking on the doors of opportunities and the doors are slammed in their faces because they walk in the door with the stigma of being an ex-felon. Let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about poverty if we're going to talk about change. But we have seen some change. Thank you. Dr. Kahn. I know there's a debate, I think, between procedural change and substantive change. And I agree with you that I think uh, the long term, the incremental, incremental nature of American politics, that substantive change is going to be very slow. That's right. I think procedural change we can do hopefully there'll be substantial changes. But the second thing that I'm, I, I must confess about the meme that has become, you know, symbolizes the movement Black Lives Matter. I've always wondered 
When there's an incident in Germany, do they say German lives matter? When there's a problem in Sweden, do they say Swedish lives matter? Black lives matter. It's a horrifying indictment of American racism and history. And we should think about that very deeply, that we in the United States, centuries later, have to remind dominant society that 13% of the population's lives matter. What has happened? I mean, why 250 years later, 300 years later, we have to remind people? It's, it's, a, it's a terrible indictment of American history. Uh, I mean, it's awful. OK. Um, I have time to entertain. Uh, were there any Twitter questions? Did anyone post a question for Twitter for the panel at this time? I'm waiting on. Well, I'll just take one from the audience then, since I haven't. Any questions from the audience for this panel at this time? Yes, sir. I don't know. That's why I'm in politics, and uh, you're going to hear from an activist. I'm not afraid to tell you. I, I don't know. That's. I think the activist panel will be the best. But from political, a political standpoint, um, I think we have to change the way we go after votes politically. Currently, in our political, um, in our political arena, we're just going after primary voters. We're, 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 there, there's a, a term called the electorate, and the electorate does not mean me and you and everybody. The electorate is just people that vote in primaries, that consistently vote in primaries that we know are going to vote. And we are a very data-driven industry right now. We only go after people that we know are going to vote, and we're only catering our messages from local elections all the way to presidential elections to those people that are going to vote. What, and this generally happens every 20 years, and it cycles out from time to time in elections. What we've gotten away from is what I call population politics, where we use more populist um, of views and we use more populist tactics to draw in thousands and thousands of people where we have coffees, where it's regular have co coffees and meet with people that don't normally vote, where we're, where, where we're at mass events and we're able to, and, and we speak to the masses. People, politicians aren't doing it anymore. We are, we're given to a, just a certain subsection. For a political movement, uh, uh, the next political movement will be someone that was just like Bill Clinton did back in the 80s, that reached out to masses, that drew people back, drew people that normally didn't vote into that electorate that were new voters, just like in 2008 as well, where we saw a small with Barack Obama, it drew new people into, into the electorate and changed the views and, and kind of pushed us forward a little bit. When we saw that in 2008, we saw it dissipate in 2010, and that's been our problem. So our, our, once again, our responsibility is to, or, is to work with activists to organize those people that don't normally participate in the electorate and bring them in so that we can expand okay. that and, and expand our, our, uh, our view. 30 seconds. Okay, I, I, I would just say you can do it but you got to unify the contradictions. So to Jamila's point of those changes that made a direct difference in people's day-to-day -day lives, you got to do that while still explaining that you haven't made structural progress so that you don't let people be satisfied with incremental progress, keeping an eye on that. The other thing, and I'm going to say this as a, because I'm, I'm a lot older than Mike, movement politicians or different, what I call what we have now, career politicians. And I don't mean that disparately, I mean it descriptively. When you come out of a movement, you come to government and politics with an agenda that's focused on a structural critique of, of the establishment and things that you're attempting to change. When you're a career politician, you just want to get elected. And, uh, and, and we've turned elections into an industry managed by a whole uh, gaggle of consultants that for me, as an old school guy, uh, consultants or the politics have the same value as pimps do. I mean, they got zero, zero value added to governance and empowering people. So I would first say you got to get to Michael's point about mass politics, popular politics. Okay. You're going to have to fire the interme intermediaries, and politicians are going to have to go back to being organizers of people 
as well as governing once they get elected. Okay, Senator Nasheed. Yeah, if, if you can repeat that question because the talks, I think, couldn't really. Senator Nasheed is the last person to respond. Into one hole. Well, well, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's disjointed. I, I think that if you go back in history and you look at uh, Malcolm X movement and the Martin Luther King movement and the Black Panther movement and the Guerrilla Black movement, all, they were not all together, but they all, they all had a mission and a purpose. And I think that each and every one of them, the mission was implemented and it was pushed out in the, on the street, not in the in the state house. They forced legislators to step up to the plate and do the right thing by protesting and agitating and aggravating. So I think if everyone continue to do what they're doing right now, the, the, the Black Lives Matter, if they keep, keep doing what they're doing, the elected officials are gonna e eventually, they're gonna have to step up to the plate and listen to the voice of the people. And I think that that's when you, that's when the movement uh, take, that's when the movement goes to the next level, is when they get the, the politicians to do what it is they want them to do. The first question for Ms. Jones. Um, Which Ms. Jones is too early. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, the Harvard Jones. <laughs> well, we recently completed a... Uh, the Executive a, Education Executive program Education program Harvard. State and local yes. executives, thank you. Um, one of the things I noticed in the Ferguson um, draft document was it talks about inequality uh, especially economic inequality. Um, and what I think that one, two things that I know are tearing up our community are one, the poor are torn up by payday loans, elderly people are taken advantage of by reverse mortgages, and Princeton completed a study last year talking about America really ceased being a democracy back in the 80s and is basically a corporate oligarchy. Right. So as a person who deals with those economic issues in the context of your office, where can you see a way out to defend those values that you know these protesters care about and then balance them with your institutional responsibility? Great. Well, thank you again for inviting me to be here today. I'm honored to be before you. I want to start with um, something I learned a little while ago about how institutions structure outcomes. And when you think about that short phrase, it says a lot. The institutions that we currently have have structured the outcomes that we're currently receiving. In, think about the institutions that we have in St. Louis, 91 municipalities, 58 police departments, or whatever the number is, 50 plus fire districts, 22 school districts. All of that structures the outcomes that we currently receive. Uh, sub, substandard education, um, uh, vast in, uh, income inequality, unemployment, the list goes on and on and on. And until we start to work to restructure those institutions, and that includes voting. So many people don't vote. Our turnout numbers are horrible. We will, we will continue to get the same outcomes. Now, what I've started to do with my office is become somewhat of a policy entrepreneur and look at what other cities are doing because I frankly feel like we have our heads in the sand here in Missouri and we're not paying attention to how other cities, how other municipalities are addressing poverty. I think it's government's responsibility to address the poverty of its citizens. This idea of this rugged individualism that everybody can pull himself up for their, from, by their bootstraps when they don't have boots is ridiculous. We have to be able to uh, help others and help one another in order to, and, and, and again, again, the government, I think, is, is, it should be very responsible and responsive in this, in this fashion. The things that we're doing in the treasurer's office, on August 25th, we're holding a grand opening for our first Office of Financial Dignity, uh, because I say dignity because when you know about your finances, you have more dignity about how you spend your money. And so in City Hall, which is a place that people don't like to come to, we're trying to reverse, again, change that institution and structure better outcomes. So people will be able to come to City Hall and get financial counseling free of charge, credit counseling, um, mortgage counseling, and we'll be putting on several programs to help people make, make better decisions about their money. 
And the second thing we're doing is making sure that children, which are our future, I know it's a cliche, but it's totally true, uh, children start thinking about college early. So starting next week when our kindergartners go back to school, they will receive an, a letter from the treasurer soon that says that the treasurer's office is investing in each and every kindergartner attending a public school in the city of St. Louis with a $50 college savings account. Because, and I'm doing this for two reasons, number one, uh, children need to be incentivized at an early age about saving for college. Their parents need to know at an early age about saving for college. The benefits are, are, are too many to name. And, and secondly, if our mayor and our state or our governor can find money to build a stadium for a team that doesn't even want to be here, then I can find money to invest in our children. Mm. Okay. You know, one of the interesting things I noticed in the Ferguson draft that came out, and I didn't know this, I don't live in the county, it said, municipal judges shall be prohibited from engaging in municipal court practice in the county in which they serve as a municipal judge. <laughs> I thought that was, I, did, I, was, uh, I was unaware of how bad some of this stuff was that was going out there. And I also noticed that in one of the working groups, they had the same firm that represents a lot of municipalities as far as the working, as far as uh, working on the document. So that didn't put a lot of confidence in me about the document. I think as someone said in the back, the back it looks like the Ferguson Commission should have just pulled out the Kerner Commission and says, we read Kerner Commission <laughs> in terms of some of the things that they wanted to do. Um, Attorney Truitt. I know last year, uh, in the capacity of working with the non-city um, lawyers, what were some things that you attempted to do last fall, I think, in relation to the legislative session, and what are some potential issues that you say, I think you've had a chance to look at the document, that you might see a problem on the horizon? Thank you. First, I want to thank you for inviting me and having me before you. It is important to get information one of the things that we did last year, we put out information regarding the entire process from voting to expungements to what it takes to be convicted of certain things. One of the things that we are very adamant about is voting because as lawyers, the jury pool is made of voters, voters and property owners. So to the extent that people choose not to vote is the extent that people choose not to be on a grand jury is the extent that people choose not to be on a jury. We, don't, we can't get you an outcome that represents your values and your beliefs if you don't have the time to serve on a jury. Okay? We can't do it alone. As black lawyers, we go out and we put our case forward. But it is difficult to understand and interpret values in a particular place. So we always encourage everybody to vote and not to try and skip jury duty for any reason. It is important that we have an opportunity to impart our values. We as the Mount City Bar Association, in conjunction with several bar associations, in fact, all of the minority bar associations were included, at least in concept, as well as the Bar Association of Metropolitan St. Louis. And we worked on legislation regarding not municipal court reform because that was not the situation for Michael Brown. It had nothing to do with municipal court reform. Rather, it had to do with the state of policing and police and how things were done. One of the things that we did, we asked and sponsored a bill that dealt with the deaggregation of data. Currently, data is kept by municipality. So all of the statistics for the St. Louis Police Department, when you're looking at the data for a particular set, it's kept together. There is no way for us to know as lawyers when we try to go after people and try to bring accountability to the system, we can't even find out who are the people that are profiling. There's no way to find that out. There's just a way to know that it exists. Knowing that it exists without a way to rectify it does us nothing. It does not help. I think we can agree that racism exists. I think we can agree that people get pulled over. I think we can surmise about how often that happens. But if we can't do anything about it because we can't deaggregate the data to determine what happens, we can't help. As lawyers, we can't help. and We can't do what we need to do. The other thing we sponsored was something to deal with written consent. 
to search people and to search cars. Every day, every summer, and you probably have had the same experience, we get people and you see them on the side of the road with handcuffs on, and they're seated on the curb every time. And somewhere in there, a car gets searched. If nothing comes up, the person may or may not make a complaint, and that's the end of that. If something comes up, the officer checks, you have given them the right to search your car. And you say, no, I haven't, and they say, yes, I have. In a court of law, the officer's word has more weight to it and more credibility than a suspect's word. Therefore, you lose that, even though you didn't give them consent. So there's no way to tell that. That is done in other states, notably North Carolina and in the Durham area and in Texas. So it's not as if Missouri would be the first. We also ask for a situation where the police officers, when they're writing police reports, to take away, in some cases, the boxes that allow you to check for probable cause. Because you will find a reason if you are going to be right. If all you have to do is check any box, and any box you check is going to be the correct box, you're going to be right. If you have to write down why you pulled a person over in your writing, then at least as a, as a lawyer, as a judge, I can at least look at it to determine whether or not you actually had probable cause versus whether or not you picked the right box for the circumstance. Because if you didn't pick the right box for the circumstances, you got a one in four, one in five, or however many boxes chance to get, you just check the wrong box, you will eventually check the right box. That's considered a typo. That, that's what that's going to be. If you have to write it, it is not. The other thing we ask for is to fix the current law. If you actually read Missouri's law as it relates to the, the data and the data collection and the reporting, it is one of the more progressive laws in the nation. It is extremely progressive and it is comprehensive. It has one flaw in it. And I talked to one of the sponsors of that bill and they basically said at the time that we passed it, that's what we had, that's what we knew. It was never meant to be a bill that was never revisited. Rather, it was meant to be tweaked as things came along so that it mirrored what reality was. In the bill, every data goes to the Attorney General. And in order to punish a municipality, the governor takes his pen out and reduces the amount that that municipality can have for its police department. Now, first off, what are the odds of doing that? It has been done one time that anybody knows of. But the challenge is very political. First off, the governor would be setting a fight in place with the senator and the representative of that area. Because if the senator and the representative of that area are doing any part of their job, they're defending that municipality which lies in their area. Now you set up a budget fight between the, that senator, that representative, all the friends they can muster, plus anybody that doesn't like the governor at the moment. And you can't get your budget passed until you do that. Rather, we would say that that, and, and that's all that the governor can do. But if you made that under the Attorney General, the Attorney General's job is enforcement. The Attorney General takes you to court. The information is given to the Attorney General anyway. So it would be easy to, easier to make that happen. If you notice, none of the things that we propose had large fiscal notes to it. You're already collecting the data, the data needs to simply be de-aggregated. So the same secretary, when you turn in your form, just puts your number in. We also ask that a, de a separate department service number or a separate number accompany each police or peace officer license so that when that peace officer went from one place to another, his or her data followed them. It's a benign thing, because if you have good data, all of your good follows you. But if you don't, all of that follows you as well. And then an officer who is making application somewhere, you can, you can test that. You can see what they've done. 
you can see, and that community has the opportunity to hire people with their values. Because if, I, if St. Louis City has at least 300 police officers, and you, we think they have more, but at least they have 300, if you had three bad C's in it, that's not even statistically significant, except if you're the person who got the head cracked. If you have one bad officer where there are 20, that's not statistically significant, except if you're the person that's continually profiled. Blue does not tear on blue, so they just allow you to leave. We won't fire you, so you've never been fired. You just leave, and you just go to another municipality. And we all do it in our professions. This was a way to stop that, at least so that the community could know. As a result, none of them were passed. None of it was passed. Our experience had been that it, it was interesting. On the one hand, you had the people who were for the police union, and they did their jobs. They were aggressively pursuing any group and anything that interfered with the way things ran. On the other hand, you had the group who sprung from the Ferguson actions. And what happened and what the legislators said was, we cannot win for losing. We can win for losing. Doggone if you do and doggone if you don't. Because okay. if the Ferguson Commission, if the Ferguson people come in and we don't do what they say, they shut us down. And if we don't do what the police officers union say, they shut us down. So either way, we will get shut down. So we won't touch it. And that was our experience. OK. Um, I mean, the last fall after this happened, um, I remember when I first saw Jeanette, I kept seeing this uh, young lady walking around. She had a flow at the time. And I mean, and I wanted to su uh, I salute her for her courage. Um, and I'm sure at that time when you started all this, you were unaware of all this corporate oligarchy, interconnected white supremacist, institutional, whatever, which might have seemed daunting. But I just saw you and your friends press on and you need to be saluted for that. And I have a question now. Um, and it was something I saw you posted on Facebook, and that's why I asked the question. And it's something I think you were, re you were trying to protect something on the inside in terms of maybe how you were transitioning. Um, what do you know now? that you did not know 12 months ago? And what has been the personal cost? Um, can you hear me? Hello? Can yeah. you hear me? OK. Yeah. Um, so compared to August of 2014 to now, um, and I've been like sitting with the fact that he was killed around 12 something mm -hmm. and maybe 30 minutes ago today last year would be the time that they actually picked his body up off the ground mm -hmm. um, and so in this past year I learned that the police in the city that I live in and grew up in are militarized and not only will they occupy our city by themselves they will call in the National Guard and they mm -hmm. will help them too um, and when I was younger, like I always, I remember like Ruby going to her first day of school and the National Guard took her to school. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I grew up thinking that the National Guard would protect people. Um, and in Ferguson, running from the National Guard down Lang in West Florissant, I saw and experienced with my, like, with my own self that the, the National Guard was prepared to kill us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that I, I've learned. <laughs> um, I didn't know that I was, um, that I was so brave mm -hmm. or that I had the courage to um, defy my grandparents and my family mm -hmm. who didn't want me to go um, mm -hmm. and who did everything in the world to try to keep me from going. Mm -hmm. um, and that's you know their own fears of what could possibly happen or what the police could do to me. Um, mixed in with just respectability politics because they're baby boomers and they grew up in the South and they mm -hmm. saw and lived and breathed this and their internalized oppression is um, to project onto me all of their fears that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and just being able to shield myself to, to let them know that I'm going to be okay and um, right now your opinion isn't needed. And that's something that elders aren't used to hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, and especially, I was, 
I was raised um, in a Christian household and I respected, I still respect um, my elders, but now we have conversations where I address them adult to adult and um, I'm able to tell them and push back on lots of the things that they talk about. Um, I also didn't know that a year ago I would actually care about things like legislation or policy or um, just learning the many ways that structural racism affects everything in our life. Um, mm -hmm. Like I knew the world was racist. I knew it. I knew what anti-blackness was mm -hmm. um, a year ago, but I didn't know that it was this deep. Um, and I, I didn't. I definitely didn't think that St. Louis would be the kickoff spot. Mm -hmm. to, um, to expose just to the world like how really horrific and um, deadly the police could be. Mm -hmm. Okay, Miranda, uh, we've heard the uh, elected official talk about the institutional corporate oligarchy. We've heard from the attorney about the, the difficulty of changing what a friend of mine calls the laws of the software of a society. Now, as a member of a community nonprofit that, ha that catches all this stuff in terms of the clients you have to deal with, people that maybe have even experienced what, what Ms. Elvie's experienced, as Better Family Life, what kind of programs have you thought about in the last year? If you could say in the next couple of minutes, what kind of programs have you all been able to implement or what's, in the, uh, what's, in, what's about to come out? Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, this is an awesome opportunity to really have some, some deep discussions and hear a lot of different points of view, and I'm really privileged to be a part of it. I will say this, uh, immediately upon this happening, um, I remember the day, the time, because I was at a back-to-school event in Jennings, and we heard something's going on in Ferguson, and we saw police leaving, and you know, being a, a resident of Jennings and the council person right next door to that ward that happened, you know, this is something that was very deep-seated within me. And I called my CEO immediately and said, what's our move? What do we do? We need to do something. As being uh, uh, one of the institutions here that's been 30, you know, 33 years in the game, what do we do? And he said, give me a second. So we took about a day and we thought about it and we said, it's our responsibility to respond to our people in that neighborhood. That we as an institution and one of few institutions that has the backbone that we have, we have an ultimate responsibility to get out there and we did immediately. We got out there, we mobilized, we had tents, we went out there. We were the first people to come out into Canfield with tents and food and, and start that movement to try to take care of our people because that's what we needed to do first. We knew that you know when they were shutting down streets and the, uh, the different pharmacies were closed, that people were going to have needs, and so that was our first move, it was to respond to those needs immediately. From there, we really got a chance to learn the neighborhood, to learn the residents and their needs, and so we started a neighborhood resource center right there. We've been there. We promised those residents that we wouldn't leave, and so we got a storefront property there. We've been uh, operating a neighborhood resource center ever since um, October, and we still operate it there today. Uh, what we're doing going forward, you know, uh, one of the things that we recognize as Better Family Life is that this is something that is not just about Ferguson. It's, it's the whole St. Louis area. And if you are not going to address this regionally, this is a really small piece of the whole microcosm of what's going on. And we know that, you know, it's our responsibility also to address those things in our neighborhoods, as such as crime. And we've really been diving into the, you know, the, the black on black crime that we're having and that we must stop killing each other and, and really focusing on all these things that have uh, led us to these issues and, and poverty being one of the biggest ones that everybody is talking about. So we have uh, lots of these different programs that we are continuing to do and strengthening these programs and going door to door and making sure that we are touching those people that won't come to us. Okay. All right. I have a question from the audience. It's uh, Black Brazy at the Hampton Kid. Uh, he's uh, the question for the panel, and please re uh, restrict comments to one minute or less. Uh, do you feel as if uh, civil rights groups such as the ACLU or the NAACP are doing enough to combat such instances from or prevent such instances from reoccurring? Can I answer? Um, I just wanted to first touch on what you just said about black on black crime. 
Um, I just want to acknowledge from my point of view that black on black crime is the language of the white, of white supremacy. You're mm. absolutely right. Um, and black on black crime is right. definitely lower than what white people like to tell us that it is. Um, and so I, I hate saying black on black crime because it's about the proximity of where you live. And yeah, if your right. whole neighborhood is black, of course the crime is just going to be black on black. The same as it is with white people and Asians, et cetera. Um, and to answer the question, um, honestly, and we, we joke about it now, but in, in early August when we were in the streets and not um, receiving the correct support that I thought would be coming, I was trying to think of a nice way to say that. Um, I thought, growing up, I'm only 26, and I thought that the NAACP was like this super group of black people with capes who would come fly in and like, you know, do some type of magic and then everything would be over and I could go home, but that didn't happen. The NAACP didn't come, um, or it didn't come until it was sexy, so after the QT burn. Um, and that goes the same for quite a few other big name brand um, organizations that are out now. Mm -hmm. and want to talk about Ferguson because it's a hot topic, but they mm -hmm. weren't there when we needed them on August 9th or August 10th mm -hmm. or the 11th. Um, and, okay, uh, continuing. <laughs> um, and the same way that um, the person in the, the panel before was talking about Palestine, I was thinking like even with the Red Cross, like why wouldn't they come and give us milk and water to clean our faces with um, when we get tear gas? But they didn't. Um, so a lot of the things that I've heard while being here, I'm just like, you know, revisionist history is a thing. And um, it's one thing to come now, a year later, when it's safe to mm -hmm. be outside because the police on their best behavior. Um, but where were you when we were out there at night, scared, mm -hmm. underneath cars, hiding from the people, hiding from police? You know one thing that's an interesting point here. I always tell people you have two different crowds, and the nighttime crowd is very different from the daytime crowd. The daytime crowd, you might have, see some people in a sundress mm -hmm. or whatever, and then when the sun goes down, you see the people in the sneakers and jeans and you know bandanas or whatever would come out. Yeah, I got my shoes in the car right now because <laughs> I know later the one on thing, something might happen. The one thing I always point out to people, um, you know, as a scholar, I always say the NAACP won most of its victories in the courtroom. You know, that's what they were, they never were a street activist group. That's why they have SNCC. That was a, it was always driven by young people in the street. So um, this is related to Blazy's question, uh, Black Blazy. Still on the question, do you feel these groups are doing enough now in response to what happened for next, for other? So I don't know if, if those are the groups that can do Okay. anything because um, what we are experiencing is years and years of institutional racism mm -hmm. and in my opinion you cannot legislate changing people's hearts and minds yes <laughs> thanks Jamila mm -hmm. but when you when you look at the problems that we have again the institutions that we have nationally and locally have structured the outcomes that we are currently experiencing and you can't, you, yes, we have municipal court reform. Yes, that's great. But, and, and the things that, that uh, Attorney Truitt, who's one of my good oldest friends, is talking about, they're great. But still, you, you, legis you pass all these bills, but still, what do you get? You still have to be able to change the minds and the hearts of the people who are instituting these policies, who, are, who are, have to implement these policies. So what are we going to do to change the hearts and minds of people who are inherently biased and inherently racist that think that black boys and black men shouldn't be in certain spaces? And that w that's what all of this was about. Mike Brown was walking down the middle of the street and, and, the guy, and, the, and the cop stopped him because he was in the middle of the street. Well, if he fixed our sidewalks, then maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the middle of the street. Okay. Uh, 30 seconds just to be It's a new together. movement. It's okay. a new movement. It's going to take a new type of leader, such as okay. the young lady right here. Okay. I think the NAACP, as Tashara said, you know, the institution was built upon some different types of principles to address okay. different things. This is a new day. We're going to need a new type of structure to deal with the new type of thing that's going on. Well, okay. It's not new. The old yeah. stuff that's going on. But we need some new ideas and new blood infused okay. into these agencies. Right. Can I just say that yep. the ACLU um, definitely. The ACLU was involved in two federal court cases in St. Louis, 
okay. um, nationally, well, the national ACLU. And um, one included the five second rule last summer. Yes, I remember that. It, it couldn't stand still. Right. Yeah, I was I a part that. of that one. My feet still hurt. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, protesters also got a restraining order against Unify Command, so they had to give us a, um, a warning before they okay. took gas. So right. ACLU has done things. 30 seconds, Ms. Troy. No lawyer talks in 30 seconds. <laughs> you have to, you have to. But, but I, 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 I do think that there is a need for new things. When this first jumped off, I was a, behind several back doors trying to figure out what the next move would be. And I was part of several conversations from several name brand groups. And I was crestfallen by what I was hearing. I was told and I heard from several of the groups, well, he did steal something. I said, when did stealing in America become death by execution squad immediately? Mm. When did we do the, when did we get there? Okay. When does he have to be more right and he's lost his life than the person who acted under the state with a gun? When did that happen? When did we go there? And then when it got sexy and money came, they came with support. One of the things that Mound City did, we saw the age of the protesters, and so what we did was we put videos out so that because they were using social media, they weren't using pamphlets. Before, when everything came, we had pamphlets out. We printed them ourselves. We paid for them. We got law firms to pay for them. The Missouri Bar paid for some of them. Okay. The Missouri Bar contributed heavily toward education, and we were out there registering voters, yeah. And we were out there passing out pamphlets to people immediately. And we were out there doing legal observations. So okay. we got out and we did some things. But in terms of the name brand civil rights, when it got sexy, it got beautiful. And money okay. came. All right. Do you think this All right. Okay. That's it. Our next panel coming out here will be some of the activists that will be. Thank you. <laughs> 